Welcome to Benjamin Banneker Historical Park and Museum. If you're looking to visit our museum, our hours are from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, and from noon to 4 p.m. on Sunday. Please enjoy this virtual tour. Okay, this is my friend, Mr. Benjamin Banneker. We don't really know what Mr. Banneker looked like. There were no photographs, and he never sat for a formal portrait but we do know that this is the kind of clothing he would have worn. The story is told that when Mr. Banneker left to go on the adventure of joining the survey team that surveyed for our nation's capital, he had been living for many years as a bachelor and his sisters and the Ellicott women are said to have commissioned a new suit of clothes for him. We might say that's because he didn't take care of his clothing but in fact, they were worried for his safety. Mr. Banneker would be working in and traveling through slave territory. He needed to carry papers saying he was a free man, but there was always the danger that he could be captured and enslaved. And they commissioned a new suit of clothes for him in part to help him look as professional as he was, a 60-year-old man of great achievements at this point. This panel tells the story of Mr. Banneker's family as we now have it. Um, we hope that more historical research will be done to document the story of his family. It begins with the story of Molly Welsh, who was said to have been a milkmaid in England. She was Mr. Banneker's grandmother. She came to this country as an indentured servant. Uh, the story is told that she was tried for theft because of a, a bucket of spilled milk. In court, she proved she could read. What could have been a capital offense was then negotiated down and she was sent to the colonies as an indentured servant. She arrived in Maryland and worked for seven years on a tobacco farm. At the end of an indenture, a servant would be given a change of clothes, some seeds, uh, a musket, and then you're on your own. This woman on her own managed to secure some land and ran a farm for a while. It's said that she purchased two slaves, but that's highly unlikely because that would have taken a lot of money. It's likely that she rented the labor of two slaves to help her on her farm for a while. Eventually, they made enough money to purchase freedom for both slaves. The one we know nothing about, the other one she married. That's Banaka. Mr. Banneker's grandfather. He had been a prince in the Wolof tribe when he was captured and taken into slavery. Molly and Banaka had several children and their oldest daughter, Mary, married a man who also had been enslaved. We don't know what his African name was. We do know he was a gifted farmer, but he was a slave who had multiple owners, which indicates that he was not a contented slave, he ran off several times and for a while lived with some Native Americans. Eventually, the last person who bought him made an arrangement with him that if he gave good labor for service for a certain period of time and became a Christian, he could earn his freedom. He did that and took the name Robert. As a free man, he married Mary and they used her father's last name as their na last name. Benjamin Banneker was their first child. He was born free and lived free his whole life. We know that Mr. Banneker's name was on the deed for the property along with his father's, though he was only six when his parents purchased this land. They purchased the land with 7,000 pounds of tobacco. For 100 acres, that was a good deal. Then they had to clear the land, build a cabin, Later, they built a slightly larger cabin. We know that because two archeological digs have been done on the property, and we have found numerous things that indicate what their lives were like. Several of them are in this case, and they're very well labeled. When you come and visit, you'll understand how he lived. I'll point out one of my favorites, a nail that is incredibly ugly. When you look at that nail and you realize that 
nails were not in common use. For one thing, they were taxed. You had to send to England for them. And you learned how to do as much as you could without needing them. So you will notice fences and furnishings that are made without needing nails. That's part of the ingenuity that the colonists had. We're not sure what happened to Mr. Banneker's wooden clock, the clock he built when he was in his early 20s. This clock that the museum has on loan is a little younger than his clock would have been, but we believe it shows the kind of clock he would have made to hang on a wall in his house. And the story we have is that he borrowed a pocket watch, figured out how that worked, and then decided to build a clock, but he would have to think of an entirely different way to make the clock. That's the kind of mind this man had. The museum has on loan one of the Ellicott telescopes possibly one Mr. Banneker himself used. His fascination with the stars and with nature, with science of all types and with mathematics, led him eventually to the pursuit of calculating an ephemeris and the publication of his almanacs. We have indications of his handwriting and notes on predictions of um, celestial events, he was a fascinating mind, and he continued to learn. His friendship with George Ellicott allowed him to borrow the kinds of technology and uh, books that were available to someone with the wealth that the Ellicott family had. It's also said that George Ellicott and Benjamin Banneker visited in each other's homes. When Mr. Ellicott visited Mr. Banneker's home, he noticed that there was no surface flat enough or large enough for Mr. Banneker to spread out his papers and books and prop up a telescope. It's said that Mr. Ellicott then had a table brought up to Banneker's cabin so that he could do that. And the table we have in the museum is said to be that table. We have on the table a digital copy of the letter Mr. Banneker wrote to Thomas Jefferson, who was then Secretary of State. Jefferson had made public statements that indicated he did not believe Africans had, um, that they had, in fact, limited intellectual ability. Mr. Banneker sent a handwritten copy of his ephemeris along with this letter. It's worth reading the entire letter and noticing how cleverly he uses some of Jefferson's own arguments against his reasoning. Jefferson, to his credit, responded uh, positively to Banneker's letter and sent it on to France, where the abolition movement was gaining momentum. We have one of the notices of Mr. Banneker's death from the press. Mr. Banneker died of natural causes on his own land. Before he died, his house had been broken into, and he had left word for his sister and nephew that when they heard he was dead, they should come to his cabin quickly and take anything the family wanted and also see that the things borrowed from the Ellicott's were returned from them. They did that. And then two days later, when Mr. Banneker was being buried, his cabin burned to the ground. We have on our grounds a cabin that is the size of the cabin that we believe he lived in, which we know from the archaeological digs and finding the foundations. 